um, teaching our doctoral students how to use it. So I have a method to my madness and a secondary reason for this talk, but I don't think we're going to get a lot of participants in the room, but I am recording it and it's getting recorded. And I want this talk available for people to see uh, at their own convenience. So uh, Dr. Graham, you'll be speaking to a small room, but an outside room. And I'm going to turn, there, this microphone doesn't really work, but I'm going to turn the microphone over to you. Come on over and all three of us give Dr. Graham a round of applause. <clears throat> Let me put this in smack in the middle so you can do that. We're recording the sound? Yep, it's recording all of it. I want to do that this way. Okay. You're on. All right. So, hi, everybody. <laughs> See you all. Um, so this is uh, kind of an odd uh, explanation, but uh, kind of this is an advocation of mine. Uh, how I came to this uh, topic was that uh, you know, after Hurricane Sandy, I had moved to the Rockaways, and um, I realized that I was in an isolated community. So I kept going around asking people, well, "How far is it to the nearest trauma center? How far is it to the nearest cardiac cath center?" And nobody knew the answer to that. And I said, well, how long does it take an ambulance to get there? Nobody knew the answer. So I actually, uh, asked, with uh, the help of a couple of local politicians, asked for a couple of uh, freedom of information requests from the fire department to get that data. And they would basically uh, ignore it. <coughs> so, so, which is pretty, I don't know if you've ever done this in government, uh, pretty common. You know. <laughs> Lawyers put it under the pile, and you have to get a lawyer to go talk to the lawyers. And so anyway, um, then I realized just in uh, 2000, the end of 2018 and 19, that the city had opened up the data um, that was available called New York uh, One Data, and uh, so this is uh, what we did. And um, basically. Um, so we're talking about delays in New York City EMS response times of suspected myocardial infarction because we don't really know if they're having a heart attack, but we know that they have called and explained it to the dispatcher in some way. And um, can I, can you sure I can. In? It'll should work. With a little luck, it'll work. Hit enter. Just click on the little slideshow there. Okay. Click down that on little, that yeah, little yeah, screen. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah that should okay. work. Okay. okay. So that's me. I don't have any disclosures. Um, other than that, I'll tell you that I never worked in EM, emergency medical services. I never was a paramedic or EMT. Uh, <clears throat> I did work in an emergency room part of my life a long, long time ago. So the background of objectives were receiving uh, timely emergency care after, for a suspected myocardial infarction is really important. There are significant health outcomes if you're delayed. Uh, the time it takes uh, New York City EMS to identify, respond to a hospital, is not reported by the fire department. They report the data of the response time, which is pretty typical across the country. So you call 911 and they record the time that it takes for you to get uh, an ambulance at your site. So the time now is about nine minutes. That's, that's their reported time. So the objective of the study is to investigate and identify variations of time for the suspected MIs from first medical contact, that's important, to uh, a hospital in New York City. And so uh, this is the, uh, the data. Um, so you, if you uh, look at this, these are the calls. So this is from seven, nine, uh, 2017. So there were a total of 1.7 million ambulance calls in uh, New York City. And uh, there were a total of, these are segments one through three, that's the highest priority ones, uh, 745,000 of them were high priority cases. One is like a cardiac arrest. Two is somebody choking. Three is suspected MIs, uh, various other things. So, and these are the segments, numbers across. And these are the number of ambulance tours. You'll see ALS 360 and BLS meaning 860. So every day uh, they can put out as many as 1,100 ambulances. Cruise. <coughs> 
Okay, so all EMS, sorry, all EMS uh, recorded data for five boroughs was a mix of Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. Uh, the data, we found 106,000 cases that were identified as suspected MIs, but only 90,627, that's a typo, were transported to the hospital. Um, and uh, these, are the, these are the categorized, they're segments, they call them segments, those one, two, threes, they call them segments. So segment two and three, so segment two is higher than three, and it's uh, cardiac with difficulty breathing. And the data was grouped to reflect uh, geography, known traffic congestions, uh, uh, associated proxies to analyze predictors of transport time, and uh, to uh, pick approved hospital. We don't know what hospital they go to. They don't give you that data. Uh, <clears throat> so we measured uh, the dispatch time, time uh, to, to assign an ambulance for a, a run, and time to scene, that's 911 call to the arrival on the scene, that's what they report in their data. And that's for every call, all 1.7 million calls. The average time is about nine minutes. Uh, time at scene is how long the team stays on scene, and then time to hospital is uh, the total time to drive to the hospital, and then the total time, which is an important number for us because that's what we use as a benchmark. <clears throat> okay, so these are some of the median times. So the median time for 911 to the scene is six minutes. Uh, on scene time is 22 minutes. Time to the hospital is 11 minutes and the total time is 41 minutes. So of those 90,000 calls, the average mean time was 41 minutes. So that's a long time when you're having a heart attack, right? That's pretty long. That's it's, the median, but the mean's pretty close to it. Oh, I'm and sorry. The, and, yeah, mean, you, and the mean is 42 or 43. Right, it's pretty close to it. The important thing for that as a report is that half of them are higher than that. Right. <laughs> right. And then we, we, so this is the, uh, you know, it's a kind of statistical look at that. And now here, look at the times of hospital. So uh, we, we split them up into uh, six groups, and you can see that 14% um, of them take between 50 and 60 minutes, and 10% between 60 and 90 minutes. So that's 10%. <laughs> I just saw eyes get wide. 10% <laughs> yeah, of 90,000 is 9,000 cases, right? 9,000 cases. And then you can see 1.2% are over 91%, 91 minutes. All right, so these were kind of the, in, the misidentified, but they, we use these uh, independent, dependent, independent uh, um, uh, study, to use in our study. So misidentified, there were 11,105 people or 12.3% who were categorized as something other than a heart attack by the 911 operator. And then the team goes on scene and they realize it's a potential suspect, suspected MI. So, the, so whose fault is that? We don't know, we can't explain that. It could be the patient, you know, on the phone call, downplaying the call, I'm nauseous, you know, or uh, I don't feel well. <laughs> or it could be that um, there's something hidden in that number that we don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe something to do with sociodemographics and languages and so on and so forth. So, but that's a pretty significant number, 12%. And severity of illness, this is what we talked about. This is a, a, an important point. So a three is a, a, a straightforward suspected MI and a two is a, a suspected MI with shortness of breath. And what that means in the literature, if you read about the literature about this, is these patients have a much higher mortality and morbidity. Uh, if, you, if you're having a heart attack and you have trouble breathing or you're hypotensive, uh, you're really um, pushing the limits. You need to get to the hospital soon. We categorize traffic between light traffic times and rush hour times, just to put two categories together, because if you look at the traffic patterns in New York, it's very hard to know when. Um, so what we did was, was, like for instance, from 10 to one in the afternoon was a light time, and you know uh, four to nine at night was a heavy time. We put them together to two categories. Um, and then seasons, we looked at uh, autumn, spring, summer, and fall, kind of get a weather look at that. Um, and then we looked at the boroughs, the five boroughs. Uh, the most populous borough is uh, Brooklyn. Second is Queens and Manhattan. 
in the Bronx and Staten Island. And then days of the week. And uh, we, um, we had some surprising findings, right? An hour of the day. <laughs> An hour of the day, right. Mm -hmm. So uh, this paper we used previously reported benchmarks in this study. This was a study of 3,900 patients done in um, uh, an area in uh, the south, Midwest, south. And so they used dispatch time. Of, uh, these benchmarks should be less than a minute. You call up, I'm having chest pain. The dispatcher should be able to find an ambulance, right? And send it within a minute, right? That's, that's what the benchmark is. Time to scene is less than 10 minutes. This was because this was over a bigger geographic area than New York City. But uh, if you look at the data, it's not a lot of the cases were greater than 10 minutes. Uh, time on scene, we learned a lot about this during this study. We knew nothing about this. We, I've interviewed paramedics, uh, EM, uh, uh, fire department supervisors to try to find out what, that, what this entails. And then the total time should be less than 60 minutes. So that accounts for, uh, let's say you're really having a bad day, snowstorms, you know, uh, should be less than 60 minutes. We use 60 minutes as our analysis for this report. Most, most reports in the literature are the, uh, in delayed EMS are, tra are trauma cases. And in trauma, they use this thing called the golden hour. So 60 minutes. So if you have a, you have a bad car wreck, theoretically, the ambulance should get there in a few minutes. They should make a quick assessment, pack you up, and get you to the trauma center because the clock starts from the trauma center from the time you call 911. We'll talk about what it really, where it's in a heart attack care, it's a little different. Varies. Okay, seasons. So these are the number of percentage of seasons, cases. So autumn was the busiest, spring was the lightest, summer, second busiest, and then winter. And um, so it's kind of, I, I was sort of surprised. I didn't think it would be that widely spread. I thought it'd be more evenly spread. People have heart attacks, right? It's a biological phenomenon, not, uh, you know, a calendar event, right? At least as far as we know. And this is uh, the time to hospital by 60 minutes. And so this is kind of startling here. You'll see that in winter, 14.4% took more than 60 minutes which makes sense, right? Because winter, snow, uh, difficulty getting around. Um, summer is the least, and, um, and then these two kind of split in the middle, even though they're widely. So this is a very high call case, but it seems to take less time. I have a theory about that because I don't know if you commute, I commute. School buses. Yeah, I think it's school related too. School we buses at some of the are, other months. Killer. And when you see the times, you like, I'm going to ask you a question, the audience. When do you think is the most common time for people to have a heart attack? When they wake up in the morning. Sorry, you got to go with the morning. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, if you look at the literature, it says around between six and eight in the morning. It probably happens when they're in the middle of the night. They feel some discomfort, but they don't figure out what to do. But the, the most common report in the literature is around five to six in the morning. So. So we'll these are the borough data. So this is, you see that Brooklyn is the most populous borough and has the most calls. Um, Queens is the second most populous borough and has the uh, lower number of calls. And the Bronx, which is the uh, second, the third least populated borough has 24% of calls and then Staten Island. It's about 500,000 people live in Staten Island. I'll give you the numbers off the top of my head. The Bronx is 1.6 million, Brooklyn is 2.4 million. Um, Manhattan is about 1.8 million, and uh, Queens is 2.3 million. So Queens is a, a, one of the most populated, uh, populous boroughs. And this is the time to hospital, 60 minutes or more. And you can see that the Bronx is pretty much across the board. It's that 12% number that we saw in the beginning. 12% of the cases take more than 60 minutes. But then you see Queens is 13.9%. And Staten Island is very um, only 5.6 percent. So uh, that's that's an outlier there. And in days of the week, um, this is kind of surprising data. So um, it looks like everybody takes Sunday and Saturday off. <laughs> I think it's <yeah. laughs> you know, 
And the Monday, uh, I, I thought I was something bad, bad going on on Saturday and Sunday, but I got to get to the hospital on Monday. So you, uh, it's pretty interesting, right? That, uh, that uh, these days of the week, um, when you think it's a biological process, I don't know, maybe, maybe it has to, I don't know, I, I don't have enough data, but maybe it has to do with stress levels. We don't know how many of these people were having heart attacks or at work, on the train, you know what I mean? It's, uh, so maybe the stress levels go up on Monday morning and go all the way through through Friday, I don't know. And uh, this is how long it takes to, the to get to the hospital by day of the week. So Saturday and Sunday is the best time to get to the hospital. It makes sense because there's less traffic. And then of course Friday, everybody who's ever driven in New York City on a Friday knows it's horrible, right? So I think this is a proxy for traffic congestion, urban density. But it's also in light traffic too. They're not that different because I think it's rush hour. I mean, I think it's buses. Buses don't fit into the rush hour time necessarily. They're in other times as well. Yeah, no. So true. and I think it's school. But we don't know. We don't. I it know. Could be, could I be. know. Don't we go don't, beyond your data, Doctor. We don't know. We don't know that. We don't know. We're working our way through this. Okay. So this is one of the uh, uh, feeds uh, slides from uh, Tableau. Tableau. And so this is the time of day, week, and uh, differences in the report in the literature. So. These are the days by color, and this is the time of day. And you can see that uh, most of our, the calls were between 10 and 12 noon, which is completely different than uh, the literature. So this is interesting to me because if I was running the emergency medical service department, I would be carrying around, you know, the, maybe the biological data, most likely to have a heart attack because catecholamines rise when you wake up in the morning. I don't know, you, it's, uh, that's what people do. They, but here it is, it's uh, 10 or 11 o'clock. This is when they're calling, right? And then you see it all drops all the way off. And then you can see the Saturday, Sunday data, which is the blue and the purple. And then you can see the days of the week um, with being uh, it's a Thursday and this one Wednesday and Monday. Monday was the big day. Right. So I don't know, maybe there is something to that, you know, you, about 80% of the city works on a Monday through Friday schedule, right? And uh, by variant data. So we looked at the, we, we did the, we did the independent t-test. Just, just quickly go through this. It's pretty uh, substantial. And so this is from a, a new logistical regression model that, uh, she hasn't seen all the data, but what we did was with this model was we took the boroughs and remember when you have a categorical uh, um, uh, data, you have to take one out, right? So you take the, so we took Staten Island out because that was the lowest uh, number. And so this is misidentified by dispatcher. These are all statistically snips. So you're, you're 2.1 times more likely to be 60 minutes or more if the dispatcher takes more than a minute. And if the dispatcher, if the, your time on scene is more than 10 minutes, you're 3.5% more likely to be at 60 minutes. This is really shocking. Time on scene, if it's greater than 15 minutes, you're 15.4 times more likely to uh, um, get to the hospital after 60 minutes. Severity of illness is still significant, but not anywhere near as significant as the others. And rush hour traffic is about the same. And then winter, I took the season, I didn't include all this. All, all those seasons were statistically significant, but I just included this uh, one. So in that paper I showed you at the beginning, which we kind of used as a benchmark, this is exactly how they did it. They took each of the uh, benchmarks and compared everything to their benchmarks. But if, when we're gonna do like the sociodemographic data, that's how they did it. So I think it's- That's our next step. Our next step, right. So these are pretty, this, so let me just take a minute to explain this time on scene. I'll do that maybe in a little bit, but, so in order to, how, how, does, how, does, the, how does it work? What's the process? You call 911 and say, I have chest pain, okay? The dispatcher tries to send you a paramedic ambulance, okay? Okay, so if you look at some of the data that's not included in the study, 
Like for instance, in the borough of Queens, it takes between 10 and 12 minutes for a paramedic ambulance to respond to a, a one and three call. Because of the size Explain of the Explain the difference of the paramedic versus the regular. Uh, so a paramedic can do intubation, give you drugs, right? They can, but the key thing they can do is do an EKG and see if you're having a STEMI, you know, ST elevated MI. And that means you have to go to a PIC hospital. Okay, so that percutaneous uh, intervention center that can put a stint in. And that's the benchmark that everybody lives by, 90 minutes from the door of the hospital, the PIC line, PIC center, to a, and actually, it's actually no, it's a from needle the call. Line. Yes. It's from the call to the table. Well, no, that's first medical, but depending on the center, like for instance, in New York City, all the PIC centers don't do don't first do medical contact. No. They do door to balloon. So as soon as they put the line in, they put the catheter in, they blow up the balloon, that opens up the artery, okay? It used to be, it used to be door to metal, but now they've changed that. Because sometimes they don't have to place metal, right? Sometimes you can just dilate the artery and you get flow, right? So the sooner you do that, the less likely you are to have significant more loss of heart muscle. Time is heart muscle. So if you're, if you're left main stem coronary artery is occluded, that whole part of your heart is dying. Now, interesting thing about, I teach pathophysiology, most cells die in three to five minutes, like the brain, the kidney, the liver. The heart lasts for 20 minutes. So maybe, maybe the big guy uh, gave us a break. But anyway, biologically, so you have more time with the heart than you do with other organs. So anyway, so that's the, that's the newest data, which is kind of um, pretty impressive, if I do say so myself. <laughs> okay, so here, this is what I was talking about. This is after Hurricane Sandy. This is right a block from where I live. You see all these big high-rise buildings. It's important to understand what the story here is. I don't live in a high-rise building, but if this was the sand that was on the middle of the road after Hurricane Sandy. They used snow plows to push the sand out of the way. So you can imagine how long it would take you, must, like during, right after the storm, if you were having a heart attack, how long would it take you to get to the hospital? From this area where I live, it's 14.9 uh, miles to a pick center. So that's probably one of the longest distances in New York City. So it's, uh, it, this may be the key to what we're gonna be working on in a future study about the geography of these pick centers and. Uh, so pick center by population, so Manhattan has eight, uh, and they have 1.6 million. The Bronx has four, 1.3 million. Brooklyn is 2.5 million, they have six. Queens has four, and Staten Island has two. So Staten Island has a small number of this, uh, population numbers are probably gonna change, but basically they're pretty close to the mark for this year. So you can see that if you have two, when you have 500,000 cases, you're probably gonna get, um, you have a better chance of getting to a pick center than if you have 2.2 million and you have four. And they're geographically located in one corner of the borough, which is kind of interesting. <clears throat> okay, so the literature, time is heart muscle, early reperfusion in the setting of ST elevated MI infarction is, is the utmost importance. Uh, the European Society of Cardiology Guidelines and STEMI is 60 minutes or less from first medical contact, 911 call, to the PIC center. So that means that we had a significant number of our patients didn't make it, wouldn't make it. That means they're actually in the PIC center and the lines in place. That's the optimal. It's 90 minutes should be run as the maximum. So the goal would be that from the ambulance call to the dilatation, of the artery is 90 minutes. The fire department data does not include which ones are pick centers. And in New York City are 24 pick centers not distributed geographically, not by population. But you can see that there are eight in Manhattan, right? And there are, which is 1.5 million people, 1.6 million people. And Queens is the second largest, probably has four. So uh, it's, a, it's an issue, a policy issue that uh, this, I put this uh, here to go vertical response time. So when we were talking about the time on scene, this paper was actually done um, in New York City. It was uh, actually the lead authors from Long Island Jewish Hospital. 
uh, basically what they did was they assigned uh, a, um, an observer to 470 ambulance calls. And they looked to see from the time the 911 call to the arrival on scene, that's the, that's the magic number, right, you get there. And then the time on scene, what they wanted to do was not, so you come on scene, right, you arrive, and then they measured how long does it take to get to the patient? And what are the obstacles in your way? And so they, on average, they found between two and three minutes delay, depending on uh, the barriers. And some of them are very interesting, which we're probably gonna do in the next paper, but just kind of a startling number, it's in the paper. 74% uh, of all people in New York City live in buildings three or more stories high, 74%. <clears throat> and they found in their study that if you have a patient in a building one than three stories, you're delayed by a minute or more. <clears throat> uh, office buildings, uh, they have all the, they, it's a very, very good study, a limited number of- uh, density, density of the population. Right. Gotta get a social demographer on this. <laughs> huh? I got some ideas. <laughs> all right, so, Communities are uh, greater than 60 minutes to hospitals and geography. So let's look at this. Believe it or not, this is JFK Airport. 37% of their cases of having a heart attack in JFK took more than 60 minutes. Which hospital would they go to? Jamaica Center is Maybe They would go to Jamaica Hospital. Yeah, and that's 60. 60 minutes, 37%. So this is why this, this paper, the previous paper, is really so important. Actually, this. Uh, this one right here, this is critical paper. Because what they attempted to do is understand what the problem was. And one of the things, I just read the paper again this morning, they talk about the type of building they have to go into. Mm -hmm. okay. Like if you go, you can imagine pulling up outside of, you know, JetBlue, right? <laughs> and they say, you know, the, the, guy, the guy on, uh, you, know, you know, I don't know, pick a, you know, Date 115. <laughs> going. Right. So now they got to schlep all their stuff, right? And then, I mean, I mean, how far is it to walk in the airport? I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome, right? Yeah. So, so and basically. They're carrying. Yeah. So this is pretty amazing data. Wow. I, I showed this to, we're, well, I'm on the uh, borough president's committee for JFK redevelopment. <laughs> and and I, I always bring that up when I talk to people who work in JFK. How are you feeling? I, I tell them, I, do you have a heart condition? <laughs> because you do. I, I should, actually, I'll tell you another story if you have time. We do. So anyway, <clears throat> if you look at the other areas, like these, this, this is an aberration. There's only 240 cases. Uh, the uh, Astoria, this one here, this, uh, uh, this blue, 23%, that's LaGuardia Airport. Yeah. So it's just predictive of uh, what we're talking about. This is Canarsie in Brooklyn, which is at the very end, right off the Bell Parkway, and all the pick centers are up toward the end of Brooklyn. Uh, Hunts Point, one of the poorest areas in New York City. Uh, the Rockaways, where I live, this is 17%. Parkchester in the Bronx, which is a very affluent, uh, you know, middle-income neighborhood, but they're very far. The traffic patterns, I, there are certain areas in New York where there's no big highway is going to get you anywhere, right? If you're in Canarsie, Brooklyn, you basically got to take streets, right? Yeah. And if it's in the, from the 10, remember the times, 10 to 12, right? So you're talking about school buses still right there. You're talking about really congested local streets. So you, these are some of the neighborhoods that, uh, Howard Beach, which is really startling, is a very, uh, well, uh, high MHI, high educated area, but they have trouble getting from there to Jamaica Hospital. Literally, it's all local streets. And if it's congested, that's gonna take time. Now this is uh, Dr. Feig's map, which shows all these calls. I'll show you that again. Uh, this is one of her charts with delay from first, oh, this is actually from a, a text from right? paper. Mm -hmm. a paper. So delay from first medical contact for pick all cause mortality. And it shows these, these are the numbers. So you want to be, the best time would be zero to 30 minutes, right? And that's, that's blue. And then you can see that the mortality goes up. So roughly, it gives you the data. So roughly for every 10 minutes, you lose a percent. So you, know, you don't want to be too, so these are the maps that 
this is the life expectancy of uh, the area, all the areas in New York City. Um, and so these are some of the areas that notice Staten Island, this area in Staten Island is predominantly an African American uh, lower socioeconomic area. Most of Staten Island is not, but this is predominantly African American. This is predominantly African American. Uh, these, this, this is the border of Brooklyn and Queens, which is uh, areas such as Fort Greene, uh, or some of the um, dif difficult areas. This is the Bronx. Um, you can see that that's, uh, so these are the life expectancies. So where I live in the Rockaways, I live right here, Long Rockaway, my life expectancy is 7.5%, 75.6, uh, 76.5. Whereas if I live here on the Northeastern corner of Queens, it's in the high 80s or 85%. So what, you know, and people struggle with this data all over, even in Nassau County. Nassau County, which is right on this border here, they have a very high uh, cardiac mortality rate in Nassau County that doesn't match the socio-demographics. They can't explain it. A guy, one of the previous uh, public health uh, doctor, he wrote a paper in 2006 and nobody ever repeated it again because I think they didn't want to know. <laughs> you know, like if you live in Lawrence, Five Towns, all those areas, the bordering, so you have to, they also, have the same problem that a lot of areas in New York have is, in order for you to get the LIJ or to North Shore, you're all on local streets. There are no, you know, occasionally, this is the LIE uh, Grand Central Parkway route. Maybe that has something, I don't know. This is the average time to hospital. This is Dr. Feig's chart, which is almost matches. Except for Staten Island. They have short time in that area you pointed to. They're in that pale. Well, this is the life expectancy. Right, but you'll notice that that, oh, that's true. Right. But, and, but they do have, they, they, out as a they do have areas. We're gonna look at SES if, at some you, you, point. If they, they, they have one big long main road that goes right through Staten Island. If you ever have to go to New Jersey and take the bridge. So you, you drive through that road. And so the pick centers are here and here. Okay, that explains it. So. Because that's the low end of the shading. If you look at the shading, the yeah. lighter colors, the shorter average time. I don't know if you can see that, but it says that this is uh, 32 to 43, and this is 75.43. So the darker the number. So here at the end of the Rockaways, which is 14 miles from Jamaica Hospital, the darker the color. And this is uh, JFK doesn't pop up on the map. Here. It's darker. It's down. It's yeah. up in the. the and then, above but 16. if you look here, this is Astoria. I don't know if you've ever been to Astoria. It's a, they have a great restaurants. It's a nice place to live, but they have a little place to drive in, of course. That's true. <laughs> okay, That's and true. this is a map oh, from no. Distance of Trauma Center. So, so, PIP centers almost universally are in trauma centers. And so, this is a map showing the, the distribution of uh, in miles. Uh, so, I put that in there to give you an idea of that. And what are, what are we going to try and call these because of the trauma paper? We would call the pit deserts. What people do in the trauma business, they call them trauma deserts. You know, like they have supermarket deserts now, right? Food deserts, right? <laughs> it's a big buzzword in public health, you know. I'm Matter of fact, sure. if you want to get a paper in the uh, American Public Health Association, just use desert. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to try that. We're going to try it. And do pit deserts. The problem is really Maybe. trying for us, because we don't have much funding. I would love to get Google to help us do this tell us how far is it really to, I actually have done it. There's a site where you can go online and it will tell you how long it takes to drive from a zip code to another site, which you put the pick center and I did that. And it tells you how long it takes to fly there. It's useful people, say you're gonna to go to Cleveland, Ohio, right now you have to drive to Toledo or should you take a plane? That's what they do. So the plane flying is 40 minutes and driving is two and a half hours. So you take a plane. But you, we tried to use that to get an idea of how long the distances are. But it doesn't help you with density and... Uh, and it doesn't, also can't tell us where the, the ambulance ended up. Right. Because we don't have that. And we know that there are going to be cri critics that say, well, if it's congested that day, they'll go to someplace else. Right. And that's why... And the other thing we don't... So it's not clean data. You have to only do approximations. But because it's 90,000, 
you can be pretty confident actually, in some of the things that you said. Dr. T doesn't know this, but I actually found the, the data <laughs> for the by hospital, the number of cardiac caps that are done uh, at each hospital. Okay. Now, you Jamaica hospital, you seem to be familiar No, I work at NYU, hospital. but I take the van when I drive to work. It's, okay, so, it's cool. so Jamaica hospital is a unique story about Jamaica hospital. It's urban planning failure at the high point. <laughs> this is urban planning failure. But it, this is an amazing story. So Jamaica Hospital has the most number, 500 cardiac cats, wow. emergency cardiac cats. That's amazing. There's nobody even close to that, right? So they have all of Southeast Queens, it, it cover the Rockaways, right? So you gotta get there. So we don't even know how many, deaths. so what are the numbers? Let me, I'll give you the bad, number, the bad news. There are 11,127 uh, deaths from acute MIs in New York City every year, 11,000. Right? So we don't even know. So now we know we had 90,000 calls, right? So presumably some of those are, so that's a 12% mortality rate. <laughs> so we don't know that number. I've talked to, interviewed nurses in emergency rooms to ask them. I don't even know it. I used, when I was a long time ago, it was DOA, dead on arrival. And then now they have one called dead on arrival and dead on the, in the emergency room, DOE. Because they don't want to take credit for the dead on arrival because when you come in dead, basically, pretty much over. My my uh, my EMT uh, 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 friends, lack of a better word, but uh, said that the um, the time it takes to deal with paperwork is the reason why they will run in saying still okay, still okay, still okay because for the paperwork that holds up the ambulance, um, they believe it's in good faith that it will hold up the ambulance to be the declaration. They can't pronounce it anyway right. um, if they're en route. So that data is not clear. Yeah, so they, it's not clear. So there's a, there's a big issue with this about the public data that's available, big issue. And, uh, and I don't know, I, I think, you know, we're kind of like a small group of researchers doing this. This is a big project that, you know, I think the Department of Health should be doing this, honestly. We're going to go try. This, this, is, this is a major public health problem. So, uh, and uh, so I did this and I put this chart to a vertical response. And an interesting paper. If you're interested in this topic, future uh, EMS faces many obstacles uh, and they are not uh, the single person involved in this problem, okay? So I tried to make that clear tonight, right? It's not because the ambulances are so slow or because maybe the dispatches are, what's really a problem is that, like for instance, there are uh, neighborhoods in uh, New York City where the college education level is 10%, right? So that means that in the zip code, most of the people you're gonna spe be speaking to on the phone are not as highly educated as people in other areas, right? And maybe they're not giving good information. Maybe they don't know. You know, maybe maybe it's a public education problem, right? So, what well, what this is what I think we need. We need more research into the delays of times of segments and EMS incidents. We need to lay it out. What's the problem with the dispatcher? What's the problem with the getting to the scene? Time on scene is really critical. I showed you that's 15.4 percent uh, times more likely to lead to 60 minutes or more. Uh, research into the causes of misidentification, uh, public health education uh, for people calling 911. So there's almost no effort by the fire department or the Department of Health, right? In some cities like Seattle, which is one of the better cities for cardiac arrest, they have teams of people. They have ads on the TV. If you're having chest pain, you know, do you know what the symptoms are for a heart attack? If, if women, this is really, I, I don't have the male female data. They don't give it, but I would suspect that if we get the data, that a lot of the misidentified are women, because they say, say I'm nauseous, or I vomited, or I'm having abdominal pain, and they're not having classical chest pain. Many women don't have classical chest pain. So we need uh, more data. Uh, research into traffic light preemption to decrease transit time. There's a system in place that uh, 
which the, we, I actually advocated with in Queens to try to get it done. So we, there's a little device you put in the ambulance and will automatically flip a red light green. Okay, so the ambulance pulls up to a red light, the guy's in the back dying, lady in the back dying. So it flips red to green and he proceeds. And interestingly, it flips it right back to red. So she doesn't interrupt the cycle as much. So I met with the Department of Transportation. Uh, honestly, the only guy who was interested was the guy who installed in from the Rockaways, but from the Rockaways to Jamaica Hospital. Every um, traffic light can be tra controlled by traffic light preemption. Just because they had, because of Hurricane Sandy, they had to change all the wiring. So the guy who did that, he's at this meeting. And everybody in the department helps going, oh, it's the delay to traffic, the buses won't get through. We can't do that. We can't do that. So this guy says to me, he says, you know, I've had two heart attacks. <laughs> and I'm, I'm in Rockaway. Please, please do it. <laughs> How long is it going to be? So he, uh, he, you know, he had uh, interest in the case. <laughs> okay, uh, research into improved access to existing PIC centers. We need to figure out how to get patients there sooner. And then research into different staffing models for EMS, which is a very controversial figure. Although, I don't know if you saw that, but um, you know, there's a division in uh, labor in the fire department EMS, right? The firefighters are considered uh, higher priced personnel. They take more money, right? It's supposed to be a higher risk job. And the EMS workers tend to be, most of them, 50% of them or more are, um, um, lower educated, uh, more likely to be multi-ethnic groups, not uh, like most firefighters happen to be white. <laughs> they're, although they're changing that to try and, but I, I don't think it's more than five or 6% are African American, even today, 2020. So what's the problem is, I guess take a minute to do this. I don't want to take so the problem is that you, an EMS worker, whether you're EMT, which is a basic provider, or a paramedic, an EMT makes about $35,000 to start, goes to $50,000. A paramedic makes about $45,000 and goes to $70,000. A firefighter starts at $45,000, goes to $90,000. So when there's a firefighter slot, all of the EMT staff have a priority to move into that slot if they pass the exam and the test and all that. So in 2017, actually when we, this study occurred, 600 EMS workers transferred to the fire department. And there was a big shortage of uh, EMS crews. <clears throat> Here's another fact, it's kind of scary. 62% of all the EMS runs are handled by the fire department. 35% are handled by local ambulances, hospital ambulances. Now the fire department pays them to be on call. They know they located at a certain location, but so we don't, so it, it, even in our best day, we need 35% help just to provide services, just to get it done. So this is how uh, underserved the whole uh, uh, issue is in a public health matter. And then finally, this this week, the fire commissioner. Um, just recommended that they would raise the salaries for EMS workers, which is a precedent breaking. The, the fire department unions have opposed it for years because what they want to do is have the division of labor so that there's more money for firefighters and less for EMS workers. So here's the split on the runs. Uh, last year, there were 23,000 fires in New York City. There were 1.4 million EMS runs. The fire department gets 75% of the budget, EMS gets 25. So you tell me, <laughs> who's saving more lives? You know, EMS workers are saving more lives. But it's lives. a sensitive issue, so we have to know that. Very sensitive. We know that. So we don't, we so I we're don't use it in, in friendly <laughs> territory. <laughs> Maybe really, not out there, we don't I know. I never, really, <laughs> never bring this up no. uh, at meetings the fire department. But my policy students know that that's where you go at. You can talk about all your clinical knowledge. You go at things that are financial, right. that are funding. That's where you go at it to be able to make a difference. Right. So, 
Okay, so policy approved collaboration established EMS pick times and quality assurance programs. They don't have, I, as far as I know, they don't have quality assurance programs. Uh, increase the number of paramedics to access to treat patients in all serious calls. And one of the policy decisions could make, um, the governor created a, a, commission, a committee called REMCO, Regional Emergency Medical Management uh, uh, Committee. And REMCO controls how emergency medical care is given in New York State. So if you live in Nassau County or Westchester County, the ambulances can have an EMT and a paramedic. If you live in New York City, it has to be two paramedics. So by simply by changing to the rest of the state, you would double the number of paramedics. So it, it, it and it's, all, it's about public policy and it's about uh, politics that like Ronnie says, you can't talk about this all in every place, get killed. Uh, program to improve public reception of EMS, uh, uh, staffing address the national shortages all over the country. There's a shortage of EMS workers. Every city, every place in the United States, there's not enough people going to do this kind of work. Um, more EMS workers are injured in New York City every year than firefighters. And you say, well, what, how do they get injured? They're dragging 250 pound people downstairs. They're standing on highways. I don't know, one was killed recently. The guy jumped in the ambulance and ran it down. I don't remember that. So it's a dangerous job. They're exposed to, you know, biologicals, right? Uh, so we need to think about fixing this problem uh, in a big way and trying to, you know, like there are schools where you can study to become a paramedic, but then you're kind of locked into, you know, that position. There aren't many places for them to go, like in nursing. I mean, spread out. So one night, one recent interview by on national TV um, was a guy who owns an ambulance company and he says, well, you know what the EMS workers of America are for? They're a route for everybody to become a nurse, a physician assistant, or an MP. Because a lot of times to get into those schools now, you have to have previous experience. And I don't know if you know some colleges, you can volunteer, they'll train you to be an EMT and you work as an EMT in the college. And they use that to try to get into medical school, uh, you know. Yeah, so, and nursing programs now too. It's used. And there are a lot of creative ways to do okay. that. Okay, so that's my talk. That's my uh, swan and, song. And stick into it. Um, what I want to do is make sure, you had a couple of other stories that um, I want, uh, one of the things I wanted you to talk about in general is the, what you learned, again, to teach my PhD students who might be listening in as well. Um, this is a large secondary analysis, and so it's a very statistical analysis with lots of limitations. But what Dr. Graham has done all along is he's done the looking deeper into the, the interviews and finding out what does this mean and how does this mean, why are we seeing this? And I did that with my informants as well. Why does this happen? And you, you get an immediate kind of uh, conversation. We'll open it up to folks who are outside as well. But I want you to start with the immediate well, conversation. Well, my first, uh, the, um, one of the persons, first of all, a lot of people won't talk to you about this. It's sort of like uh, you tell them I'm a nursing researcher, I'm working on a project on EMS times, and we're trying. How, now, I, now, what I tell them is I'm trying to improve the quality of work for EMS workers. <laughs> that's how I thought I started. That's now. a good policy point of view. <laughs> right. That's good. And so, but one fellow was nice enough to explain. He was a supervisor. So for every uh, five or seven ambulances, depending on where you live, there's a supervisor who's a paramedic. He drives in a, a, a regular, like a four by four. And he will respond to all the levels one, twos, and three calls with the paramedic team to help. Uh, but sometimes they tied up with administrative things. So he was nice enough to explain to me, and he basically told me that, um, you know, many times uh, there's not enough people come to work on a given day <laughs> to staff all the ambulances. There's uh, issues about uh, some of the ambulances. If you look at the numbers, some of them are startling from the dispatch time. Some of them are 20 minutes before an ambulance is even dispatched because they think it's a low-priority call. And so what we think has a lot to do with sociodemographics, you know, like everybody knows, oh, that's Brownsville, or that's, you know, and, 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 and they're biased by actual facts. A lot of times they go on these calls and, you know, the guy, 
uh, on drug, uh, uh, you know, alcohol, uh, unconscious, right? But they're not really unconscious. <laughs> you just have to wake them up, you know, take them to the emergency room. So it's a big problem, and I think um, it's secret data. Nobody really knows this stuff. And, um, Unless you get Dennis in your face. <laughs> yeah. So where are we heading from here? We're, we're going to write another paper. We're writing a paper um, about this data. Pick deserts. <laughs> with, with, which will include some of the sociodemographics, which will include all the sociodemographics, such as median household income, level of education. Um, we're going to try it. Uh, we don't know race. We know race by, by zip code. So a I, proxy. Yeah, we proxy. can get a proxy for some of these secondary data. You don't know the you don't know any individual. Right. It's only secondary data. It's the call. It's not the person. Right. And so if we, we if we're going to do by taking zip code data to use proxies as the percentage that would be the likelihood um, to right. put them into the model, and that's what you do with large data sets best you can with yeah. all the limitations. And that zip, go code, with it. zip code data has been used in many many studies. It's it's okay to use. It's not it's, you know it's real. You know if if you, if you live in uh, Brownsville, it's eighty two percent African American. You know <laughs> that's a hard number. You know it's hard to get around that. You know you can't tell where that ambulance went. You know. But it's an 80% chance it's going to. We can put that into the model and in, in a in the kind of model that you can put when you have 90,000 calls. Yeah, this you is, have that large a set. And now this is old, so we're going to. He's going to have to start getting new stuff too. Or we're going to get critiqued on that as well. But it takes a year to get it in that it's clean, that they actually report it. So we're 2017, 2018. All yeah, 2017. Well, 2018 data is available. 2019 is come be available very shortly. So how is this done? This is laborious work. They give you uh, essentially the calls, they identify what the, the dispatcher calls it the diagnosis, and then the final diagnosis by the team on site, and then they give you the times in seconds and um, for each one of those segments that I told you, dispatch time, uh, time, time to scene, time on scene, time to the hospital, and then total time. And then they also have another one Ronnie was interested in is that how long the entire call takes. So you get to the hospital, you got a patient, you know, you got to get them on the hospital bed and somebody takes care of them and you're off duty and you got to clean the ambulance and the turnover time. So the average EMS ambulance does five calls a night. We have it returned to the house. Yeah, return you know, to the house. Right. But they yeah. also could be going out to lunch. I mean, it's going to not be clean data. We have, we have, we have, we have that we have, data point. Right. So what I'm hoping will happen is that the, the city council just appointed a new uh, director for emergency services, including fire and police, the leader, city council member, he's from Staten Island. And I'm hoping that um, he's trying to become mayor or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> because maybe he'll uh, tackle this. Uh, um, you know, the borough president of Brooklyn, uh, he's running for mayor. I've talked to him about this a couple of times. Uh, so uh, so he, he's aware of it. He's, he, he actually, I don't know if you know this, but uh, you know, in the police department, they use this thing called ComStat, which is they take all the calls and they break them down into geographical things, what they are, seriousness of them. And every month, all the police captains, commanders from every precinct go and they get grilled about how come this, the more robberies, yeah, how come this took so long for, you know, set the car to get, uh, it's all there, it's data. So a friend of mine actually invented the system. And he, he uh, the borough president was, worked for, he designed some of the computer systems for that. When he was a policeman, he, he was a retired police captain. He, uh, so anyway, you know, we need something like that in the fire department. So every month, they should be looking at all their calls, seeing what were the obstacles? Why did it take when you arrived on scene at you know, 10 a.m. and you stayed on scene till 10.40, what was the problem there? You know, was it you couldn't find the person? Was it, was it so complex? You know, so I think that, you know, it just makes sense. In the age of big data, this should be all automated, you know? So, uh, 
That's a good segue to Tableau right, so. and a demonstration, but I want to do something before. Dennis, thank you, okay. but don't go far. No. I have a nice seat there. Um, before I do that, you guys that have been out there, I'm going to give you an opportunity to unmute. If you want to unmute and ask Dennis any questions at all, please do. Mary, especially. Yeah. I know your work. Um, Mary, Mary is online, and I don't know if she stepped away or if she's able to unmute, but Mary's been working on some American Heart Association um, research on uh, the kind of response to cardiac arrest. So Mary, if you want to unmute, I'll give you a chance to do that. While she's doing that, I have a question. Um, the winter, I know it was 2017 data. Yeah. Did they look that there was actual snow on the ground? Well, it was a, it was a snowy winter, yeah. It was, okay. It was, it was more, like this winter was very snow free. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to see if that makes a difference. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, if that would make a difference, because the streets that are narrowed now are right. narrowed even right. more. And at a time, and I don't know if it was back in 2017, they would have a problem with their ambulances being stolen because they always left them running, that they were starting to send two ambulances to every call because the second ambulance had to watch the first ambulance to make sure nobody stole it. Correct. And Dennis, you have a question from the UK. My colleague in England is sending you a question. Go ahead, Judith, and send it if you want to type it in that. We can't hear you, so why don't you type it into the chat window for me? Yeah, so that's a, that's an issue that was, that's why I think, you know, this is beyond uh, my scope mm -hmm. to do this project myself. You know, I'm semi-retired adjunct here, you know. I do this as an application, trying to help uh, New York City be a better place, you know. And uh, but uh, you know, it it could easily get a big grant and have a team of people working on this, right? So just think about it. There's 11,000 uh, heart attack deaths every year in New York City. If how many of those could be saved by getting to the hospital sooner? You know? Well, I think they look, need to look at the data, like. You said this is old data and they should be looking at it monthly yeah, prospectively, or yeah, yeah. at least quarterly and well they may you know they may do this but, but, there, but, there's, but there's nothing there that right. tells you that right and there's no and no and you know people you know you know, that most of the doctors who work for the uh, fire department they write papers and everything but they don't you rarely see any discussion about how EMS response times, their, their papers all over, are many, many, many written, but it's, it's interesting to see how few they are and how hard it is to get the data. Some cities actually have, um, uh, like in New York City, now, I, 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 my last work life was in uh, Sloan Kettering, used to work in the urgent care center. So we used to get patients from New York City ambulances, right? That would have, one of our patients having a heart attack or whatever. So they had a, they have a, an equivalent of an iPad, not an iPad, it's an, you know, similar to that. And they record all this. They record it. When they got to the site, they record. And then I remember, because I used to sign an MP, used to sign off, just to say, hey, you want to review this? I'd read it. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> sign, it. <laughs> well, sign it, say, you know, thanks for bringing the patient here. <laughs> You know, but I had no idea that it could have been 50 minutes, you know, from, uh, could have been an hour, you know, but with, uh, so it, 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 it's sort of like being the small man at the bottom of a big mountain, or a woman, and you know, how do you, how do you, uh, Coming I mean, closer to the video screen for me, Dennis, because I don't want to mess with the camera too much. We have a question from the United Kingdom. A little closer to me, because I'm going to be able to see you here. So come closer to it. So my good friend, Judith Hunter, was a uh, director of nursing in the uh, UK. And her question is, uh, we have a system in the UK where defibrillators are located in our community. Is there something similar for your community? When we phone 999, which is your yeah. 911, we're also given the location and code to access the defibrillator to use ahead of the ambulance arrival time. Uh, I, we do have defibrillators located in various locations, but people usually don't know uh, where they are. Like, do you know where the ones are here? They're on the elevator on the first floor. The elevator on the first floor is a defibrillator. Uh, I have a habit of doing that wherever I am. So it's <laughs> my, kind of like a, uh, you know, my 
way of life. So I look for it, you know. So yes, they are available, but they're not um, uh, readily accessible as they maybe should be. Like Is for instance, connected? the one here, the one here, when you pull the lock, security gets called. And some other places where they have a lot of theft problems, like you talked about the ambulances, you have to call security to open the AED. So it's, uh, so that's a real issue about, you know, I don't know if you've ever noticed policemen when they get out of the car, they lock the car. Because <laughs> yeah. they steal it. <laughs> to be stolen. So. Yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. And, um, and then you need training to use them. And Seattle, Washington has the best educated public in terms of cardiac arrest. They have the best survival rate for cardiac arrest. They went to a whole educational program. Everybody, Mary, I'm school. not able to get your voice in. You need to unmute your mic, but that's why I wanted you to hear that too, because the training is beyond the, the responders. It's right. also the community-based training as well. Exactly. So, so, so you you know, so it's an important point. But we wanted to try to do this before they have the cardiac arrest. You know, unfortunately, the number, when you have a heart attack, about between 30 and 40 percent of people die almost immediately from the heart attack. So it's a pre-terminal pre condition in many places, occasionally. So the 60% that you can help really have to get to the hospital too sweet. And you gotta get to the right hospital. Like friends, I know all of you, I'm sure many of you hooked up EKGs on patients, right? I work in a little clinic now, a free clinic in uh, Nassau County. And uh, we have an EKG technician who volunteers there. She'll do the EKGs. I'll say, oh, could you get an EKG? Sometimes it takes like 15 minutes to get all the little suction, you know, all the paste and things to work in it, you know? And so you can imagine in some high rise building, you know, you know it's, or out on the street when it's 10 degrees and somebody's laying on this, you know, sidewalk. So it's, a, it's an issue. And so we could, we could work on that. These are all technical issues I think could be solved if people really um, were aware of what the issues are which is what we hope our data will do. There's a follow-up on that that's a community, uh, she says they have a system of community first responders to support the ambulance service that lay people or retired medics and nurses Correct. are available. So that's what we look in the literature about that. Um, in that paper I told you about vertical uh, issues in, in EMS care. So um, some of the, uh, in the discussion section of that paper, the team talks about that if when you call 911 from your house, you live, but I don't know if you know, some of these public housing projects have names, you know, that uh, like in East New York, they call them the pink houses, mm -hmm. the pink, yeah. right? So if you're on the 17th floor of the pink house and you're living alone, you have a chest pain, you call 911, you say, I'm on 17A, right? And then the paramedics may arrive, the doors may be locked or everything. So what you're what this lady is talking about is that when they call 911, they should be a team in the building to help you know, civilians that say, where is that, That's where it. is the call for 17A? Yeah. Maybe to get the AED, go up, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, isn't that like the fire, um, you know, when the fire bells go up, there used to be, and I'm not sure they still have them, they used to have a fire wooden yeah, no, that's, for yeah. each floor with at least one or two backups if that person was out. Yeah, well, I mean, we you, you think after 9-11 that we will learn the lesson. Every public building in New York City, New York State, this, this building right now has an assigned fire warden. It's usually a security guard. He may not be in the building, and he or she has to know how to, you know, where the alarm goes off, and they're, they're supposed to lead the, um, you know, the, parent, the fire department to the site. So, oh, it's in the basement of the Hagen building, and I'll, I'll bring you down there. They literally bring them down to where the smoke is, right? If they can, where it's not dangerous. We don't do that for emergency medical care. That could solve a lot of problems, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, we're talking about an economy, we're moving an economy where people are going to lose their job because of, you know, a high technology, right? Uh, computers, Amazon, right? You know, no more jobs, supermarkets, right? Maybe this is the world, this is, could be the place, right? Judith also has one more last one. I wish you could talk to us. I love, would love to hear your voice, but I will read it for you. I'll try and sound like you. We also use the app, What Three Words? 
is an app that have mapped the globe so you know where you are at all times and can inform the emergency services. Yes, I don't know about that. It's, it sounds pretty cool. All right, this is Unstar, great. We have an international Unstar. connection. How cool is that? I was saying on star, you know, if you have that in your on star, table, same sort like of that. thing, yeah. probably, but yeah. getting it, you know, when the airbags go off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, getting No, it's connected. interesting if you commit a crime, uh, the FBI knows yeah, where your cell phone you. is. Right. <laughs> like my cell phone is on now. I mean, it's not on. It's, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have the press. They know. Yeah. They know where I am. <laughs> so it's we don't do the same thing in uh, emergency medical care. And um, any other thing? There's another policy issue which I just bring up briefly, is that a lot of the calls sh shouldn't be 911 calls, mm -hmm. right? So of 1.7 million calls, people estimate that probably about maybe as many as 500,000 to get to the hospital another way. And that's what Accessor Ride is all about and all those things. But if you call 911, the fire department is required by law to respond sure. to that. And they cannot not take you to the hospital. Even though you, they know you could have walked. And uh, so it's a problem. So I these are big policy issues that have to be addressed uh, I knew somebody that was pregnant and she thought that when it was time to go to the hospital, she was going to call 911 and they were going to come and get her. Yeah. And I looked at her and I'm like, well, it doesn't you know, work I, that way. I, I, ironically, uh, there are, you know, in community, there are communities that that does happen. It does happen. People use 911 like it's a... It's a service. Yeah. Right. And they don't, they, they don't, you know, if you didn't know anything about this data, you know, there's a thousand ambulances every day out there. And then you say most of them are just sitting around. Well, most fire trucks are just sitting around too. But when you really need them, that's when you really need them. And, uh, and interesting, firemen can go on a call and if it's not a fire, they leave. <laughs> but the EMS people can't do that. So it's a, that's, that's where law, policy, healthcare come together. So we hope to uh, hope to get this off my back so I can move on to other things. <laughs> he says. That's well, it's also, yeah. you know, you used to have respect for the ambulances and moved over. So I was on the highway and the, the bumper to bumper traffic. Mm -hmm. And there is a fire truck trying. Nobody would move. And there was a shoulder people. So I just decided to move and wait until he could get in front of me. And I, I didn't go and people were beeping their horns, but there was enough room for people to move, but they don't move out of the way of the fire trucks or the ambulances yeah, no, or a, that's public education too. Public I education. mean, and it as, is as, as, as simple as it sounds of having that, but my informants also gave me because there's a, I have gotten immediate pushback on what are, you, what, what are you what are you doing you don't know what it's like for us there so i got that from the yeah, that front line guys who would go and what they tell me is that you know, people are stupid and they're in the way and they don't get out of the way it it you know, we have other kinds of public education like wash your hands there's a coronavirus. that's pretty so stupid he, he, but he, if he, you started blanketing that it's an interesting thing too. he also was really unhappy one of my friends was unhappy about the light the light change and the middle lane. There's uh, some places I saw yeah. the using the middle lane move over for emergency. Right, so, so the middle Sometimes lane. Sometimes they paint the lane. Paint the lane. Yeah. Different yeah. Policy, you know that like it's an emergency. You're supposed to move right or left. Yeah. So they get so he was pretty So I made a suggestion it. when I met with the Department of Transportation about this three times. I, I said because um, they shut down my traffic light preemption. I said, well, how about the bus lanes? And they looked at me. Yes, they, the bus lanes are mostly empty most of the time, right? So why can't e EMS, fire, police use the bus lanes? I mean, it's an emergency, so right? Yeah. Make sense. Oh, they go, well, well, that'll slow up the buses. I said, no, I mean, it's not the buses. You know, they pull over and the ambulance goes by and then right. they pull back in, you know. So there's a, a lot of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, cellular. Uh, territorial. Ter territorial issues that, uh, you can't, you can't, almost impossible to fight. But anyway, at the end of the meeting, they wouldn't go for the traffic lane preemption, but they said, we'll consider letting them use the bus lanes for emergency vehicles. I said, well, 
I said, could I have that in writing? <laughs> could you send me a letter? Like, how many years? Uh, it's 2012 and 13. Oh, started, wow. That's when I started this. So my point always is use data when you want to make policy try it. That's my, you know, my mantra. So what I'm going to do in the last three minutes, because I don't have much to show, but I want to show how cool it is. Uh, this is this is my Microsoft account that all of us at Malloy have. And if you opened up all apps, um, I actually have installed on my all apps Tableau and all apps are here. And right here, um, what Malloy will do for us, not that I know they'll necessarily do it for everyone, but I bought a few accounts to get us using Tableau so that we can in fact do learn analytics. They install it on your own account, so you, it is your own account. That is, I wish all of our software licenses worked like that, because that's how it ought to work. Then you assign it to a person who's going to use it, and you would get it. So mine's on my, so my account. Uh, I'm going to bring up my wonderful map that Dennis has used in his talks. That is the five boroughs of New York. This gets made by putting in, all we have is Excel data and zip codes. This got done automatically. I also published um, a map of the United States with average loan debt by state. So when uh, I had the state and the uh, loan debt in two columns in an Excel spreadsheet, it put them up on a map of the US color coded with this distance thing that you, you saw. But, um, with the calculated time over here, which is 31 minutes to 74 minutes on the five boroughs. And when you hover over any of these zip codes, it tells you the average time. So this is the, the product of it. You can turn it into a PowerPoint slide, all of that. But when you want to work on the data itself, I'm going to show you one quick demo because I'm not that good in Tableau, but I'm getting people starting to use it. The more users we get, the better we'll get at it. Dennis's Excel spreadsheets with 90,000 calls has taken hours and hours and days and weeks to clean. So there's no doubt it's not trivial behind it, but when you have it, you can merge two databases if you have a unique, two Excel spreadsheets if you have a unique identifier. So we're gonna merge two zip codes and other census data related zip codes. We can merge them in Tableau. He's been doing that by hand, bless your heart. But when you get this type of map, if I wanted to break it up, say, for example, by borough, I can drag borough over to it and it will separate <coughs> out five maps by borough. And I can make them larger and I can zoom in on them and I can do whatever I want to see. Let me try and zoom in an area. Do this, do this. I want to make this big. And it'll make that bigger and then it changes that for all of them. Um, I can then throw it away. I don't want to look at this borough. I want to look at time of day. I, said, I did rush hour. I thought that was kind of cool. That's when I realized that ooh, I think we have a rush hour here in traffic category, right? So um, we have rush hour and non-rush hour, and it'll split the map into two different ways that you can point and click. So in terms of what Dennis is saying, everybody's either paying a consultant to come in and do analytics for you. So if you, just so some of you didn't see the data, but you see that, that, that looks, how the arrows to, by JFK Airport? So they, that, that, you can see that that's a different minutes. color, right? That 52 longer, minutes right? at light and traffic. And Howard Beach, I told you about Howard 56 Beach. 56 minutes Beach at rush is, hour. Is west of there. So those are the landlocked areas where it's very hard to get to like Jamaica Hospital. So this is the cool stuff you can do as we've done because we could get a map of the five boroughs. Um, I can even analyze it by borough if I, when I did that. Um, I tried something else to see whether or not this right now does the average calculated time, but it, within that you can also decide in the measure that I could have the median time for people that want to do that 50% versus uh, average time, which are sometimes different if the data is skewed, but with 90,000, we're it's pretty good, good that it's within a minute or two. It's not that different. But um, this is the median time, and so you can change the map in the view. We're currently using it for um, hour of the day, day of the week. Uh, I don't think I have any of that to show, but 
um, let's see if I've got the survey. So, so let, let me just uh, tell you a little story. When I didn't tell you the story when I filmed I talk about Jamaica Hospital. So Jamaica Hospital, if you look, when you look, one of the areas I'm looking into is why we have hospitals where they are. And basically, historically, they were they'll put there, like Jamaica Hospital is 140 years old. The farm building made it a hospital. So when they, the Van Wick Expressway, when they ran the Van Wick Expressway through underground, they put that cut right through you get caught in traffic they made no exit for Jamaica Hospital so they have to go all the way past Jamaica Hospital to like Queens like Boulevard or Jamaica Avenue come around and make a U-turn and go back and so what happens is when if you've ever been on the Van Expressway to find traffic mm -hmm. as soon as you get on essentially it's gridlock mm -hmm. so the ambulances get off and go on the service road mm -hmm. And then they try to fight their way back and forth through side streets. And that's why they have 37% of JFK MIs uh, are 60 minutes or more. And they're about three miles from Smith Hospital. Yes, I'm so shocked when you said that, but it's right there. <laughs> well, the next time, next time you just think about how you, just think, you, you, just as an exercise, when you're in a spot, like sometimes I'll be in Brooklyn, I'll say to myself, all right, how do I get to Kings County Hospital? And just think about all the twists. It's just like the Long Island Expressway. You cannot, there is no exit for Cross Island Parkway North. Right. You have to get off the highway right. and you have to get off of it two exits back because they closed that exit. And then you have to go down the hill, around the bend, up the thing across the highway, come back down the other side to be able to go north. But meanwhile, the road is here and I'm crossing over it. But you can't go that way. So let me show you one last thing. So, um, and that way we can let people get to where they need to go. Um, this was affectionately known as my lasagna map. <laughs> I'll explain that in a second, but um, I'm trying to get rid of these guys over here. Uh, this is the map that Dennis showed you, and that's the spaghetti map. And if you see hour of the day, you can hover over that as well, and it'll tell you that this is Monday, and this is the number of calls at 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. And you can hover over any of these points. What, what was most revealing to us is this, this is 90,000 calls, all the seasons, all the days of the week, all of the months, all the different things that impact. It's not just some unusual holiday. 90,000 calls, that's the pattern of when the calls come in. So it's really powerful way of demonstrating it. But the most, the coolest thing about Pavlo is if you were trying to make a point, you can hover and see actual data on any point along the map. Uh, that lasagna map, which is always fun, is where it combines all of them this is the, it's the width of it for the day of the week, not the height of it. So it's not that that's the highest day, it's the width of it. So it takes explanation, but these are the kinds of visualization um, techniques that um, I want our students to be able to do. I want our students to be able to show it in data. Uh, you can switch these to other types of charts and graphs. Uh, when it, this show me shows you what's available for you, Sometimes they're useful, sometimes they're not. Uh, this one's color coded. So I think this is by the size. No, actually this one isn't the size one, but you've been seeing a lot of the visualizations that people are doing to show you in data instead of table after table after table. So that's been my fun of working with um, Tableau. And as I said, I'm trying really hard to make the case for Malloy uh, that we would be able to have available to us this kind of analytics power. Uh, Dennis usually uses Excel. His Excel skill at making charts and graphs are much better than mine. I know Keith no, has been my backup. Around, it's from the policy issue. It's the fire department every month took all their data monthly, looked at the time of day, day of the week, right? They can put temperature and, you know, weather patterns, right? Just think about how much money and effort Google spends to find out, you know, well, Amazon, what, what 
shoes you like. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they have they have thousands, millions of people doing this, you know, and they have huge machines, and he, they have life-saving issues that are. Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm a partner in crime with Dr. Graham. Please join me in thanking him for the presentation. Thank you, Vince. And, uh, if anyone else has anything else from outside that you might want to ask or say, we're gonna wind this down for now. And as I said, it is recorded, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to see it as well. So I'll give everybody a moment. Thank you. All right, thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. Thank you. The, the traffic light free preemption. Yeah.